really take a moment. This has taken a lot of work, a lot of passion, a lot of time to get to this point. And um, she has done, and it would not be the same without Mr. Ferro. I don't see him. I'm sure he's working behind the scenes as well. And the rest of the team as well. So thank you all for what you have put in. I think that there is not one person in this room who will not leave changed, thanks to your work. And then I wanted to thank you all for being here as well, because it's actually a real privilege to be able to be here and to share this next 30 minutes together. And not only now, but to share the day. You're welcome at any time to come and we can talk and you can ask any questions. I would love to know more about who each one of you are as well. And after this, I look forward to working with all of you as well, because you are the innovators. You are the change makers. You are the people who are able to bring lifestyle medicine and true health to yourselves, to your patients, and to your community. So kudos to you. Some of you are already doing it. <laughs> now, without further ado, I'd like to really start talking about lifestyle medicine. Thanks to Dr. Deal, who has put in so much of the evidence behind this and who really is one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And I stand humbled by him. I've been working in this area for a couple of years compared to you know, a couple of decades where Dr. Deal has been in this space. And we all stand here because of the work of so many people who have gone before us. So I really want to acknowledge that and thank you. It also gives an opportunity for me now to have the fun job to be able to talk about where we are now and where we are going in the future. Now we call it non-communicable disease, the international word, but really what it is is chronic disease. So you'll hear us using those terms interchangeably and really non-communicable is chronic. Very briefly, I want to outline the global burden of disease. And the main issue here is that we are facing a pandemic, a pandemic of disease. And we've heard the statistic that two thirds of all diseases by 2020 will be non-communicable disease. Um, it is already three quarters of deaths are um, due to non-communicable disease, due to lifestyle related non-communicable disease. I want to describe some of the solutions and then I want to give you just a little bit of an idea about what people like you as clinicians, as people interested in serving other people and people who are passionate about lifestyle medicine, show you what else is going on around the world. So I want to start just with a brief story um, of Mr. Bashir. He, he's happy for me to share his name and to share his story. Two years ago he came to me as a family physician and he actually came with a broken hand. But I noticed that he, his body mass index, so his BMI was well over 40. So he was morbidly obese. And um, I mentioned it and asked if he was interested. And initially he, he sort of looked a little puzzled and then he said that I was the first physician to have mentioned his weight in over two years. So to cut a long story short, it's something we need to be talking about more. It's something that we actually can do something about. Now, 18 months after that, he lost 80 pounds. He, along with those 80 pounds, lost his high blood pressure. He lost his diabetes. He lost his cardiovascular disease. His plaques were significantly reduced. And him and his wife have now actually taken on looking after his grandchildren. To put it in his own words, he regained his life. Now I put this uh, little quote as well, that what is coming is better than what has gone before. And in his sixth decade of life, he really felt that he had never ever felt better than he feels now. To put it on a global stage, these are the facts and figures from 2016 of the World Health Organization. There are 7.6 billion people living here on Earth. And of those 7.6 of us, 54.2 million will die per year. And of the 54.2 million, almost 40%, so 
So 32% is going, will die of non-communicable disease. Of those, as you can see, ischemic heart disease and stroke are the top two killers. And those are two of the most modifiable issues when we talk about lifestyle medicine. The global burden of non-communicable disease is really easy to, um, to quantify, but the problem really is that it's not just about quantifying it. The problem is who is most affected? It's an it's a, um, issue for us here in this room. It's an issue for the other people here in the hotel. It's an issue for the other people in Lahore. More than anything, the majority of cardiovascular deaths, the majority of lifestyle, where lifestyle medicine is needed, is in low and middle income countries. The diseases are caused, really diseases of affluence. And as we increase in the ability to eat junk food, which tastes great but is terrible for our bodies, really the diseases are happening exponentially. Now that's a problem because of the double burden. Low and high income countries, the high income countries have a lot of non-communicable disease as well. But the low income countries, I suffice to say here, that this double burden. We here in Pakistan are struggling still under infectious disease. Diarrheal disease is still the number one killer of children under five. And yet, by 2030, which are the bars far to the right, most of the deaths will come from non-communicable disease. That also means that economically, we are struggling under this burden of infectious disease and this burden of non-communicable disease at the same time. That is completely unsustainable, unsustainable on a health, from a health perspective and unsustainable from an economic perspective as well. I use Ebola as an example in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Really, so there is 5.4 million people died in conflict in this last area, in this, in this last decade in the DRC. So that's more deaths than almost anything else. At the same time, diarrheal disease, cholera, typhoid, as well as tuberculosis and HIV are taking lives all the time. And now on top of that, we put Ebola. Yet, in the DRC and in most of these low or middle income countries, there is this double burden of undernutrition and malnutrition. So people, some some sectors of society still do not have enough calories, but there are more and more of us who have a calorie-rich, nutrient-poor diet. And this is really where lifestyle medicine comes in. The beauty is, as well, that if we all turn towards a more plant-based, whole food diet, there will be no need for world hunger. If the production moves more to whole food, then there will be enough not only to feed everybody, but to feed everybody a micronutrient-rich diet. Now, if I could ask for the, this video to be played, this is the change in obesity over time. Now, bear with us, because we're going to go to YouTube and bring it up here. And we're going to go to the other tab. And it's going to show, actually, from... <laughs> Before 13 years old and weighing 87 kilos, Hector Pena is fighting obesity. Last year, he weighed 107 kilos. It's then a the school nurse it. warned Hector's... Mm -hmm. That's fine. Which is also a very interesting, an interesting topic, but we haven't got time for it today. But what is changing in our, in our youth and in our teens. But this, we can just show this one as fine. It's really the changes in obesity. This is specifically for women. If we can go back, yes. That the green and the blue is slowly changing to orange and red as all over the world. The average, the median weight, as well as the mean weight, so the midpoint weight and the average weight for women, this is specifically for women, is increasing exponentially. And now this is not an issue in one country. This is an issue everywhere. We can go just back to the presentation. So this shows really in 1975 what it was like. I was hoping to be able to show by 2014, it is almost all in the dark red and the red. 
Now, what is the solution? Non-communicable diseases have overtaken infectious diseases as the biggest killers worldwide. And the paradox is that the unhealthy marketing of products which cause these conditions, at the same time as the importance of economic progress, is what is causing this combination. And this is from Margaret Chan, who was the previous Director General of the World Health Organization. I'm briefly going to talk about diabetes simply to say that 1.5 million deaths are directly attributable to diabetes. But in Pakistan, there are three different things. Now we can see these are, these are statistics from the World Health Organization. So we know that there is always a delay of a couple of years. So they go up to 2016. But you can see very briefly here, and I'll take it, I can show here, that non-communicable diseases are estimated to account for 58%. So almost half, right round to this light blue line, 58% of all um, deaths in Pakistan. So there's 193 million people in Pakistan, and almost half of those people are predicted to pass away from non-communicable disease. The lifestyle um, factors include tobacco use, and as has been highlighted already, it's something that's a very modifiable risk factor, incredibly easy to change on paper, incredibly hard to do. I've heard people say that tobacco addiction is harder than the cocaine addiction to stop. So that is a, a very modifiable but very important risk factor. And these are the global targets. This is where Pakistan is. There is a huge, huge need here for a decrease in smoking. Obesity is predicted to increase almost exponentially. Now this goes, this is to 2020 here, 2025, and these are the targets. It's going to be almost 25% above the targets. And hypertension, the worst of all three. The beauty is that we don't need three solutions, we only need one. One solution for all of those modifiable risk factors and one solution for diabetes as well. Now this diabetes, I simply show this graph to show that it's gone from just around 5% to 15 But that actually means that the numbers have tripled. The numbers have tripled in only 20 years. And in the United States as well, we look at obesity, we look at the burden of disability, because obesity can cause so many of these non-communicable diseases. Ischemic heart disease, lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they stop people from enjoying life, stop people from working, stop people from being able to do what they want to be able to do with their families. So it's not only the diseases themselves, but there's a loss of productivity, there's a loss of economic growth, and there is a decrease in happiness. We'll talk about that in a moment. So how did we get there? And this is a great quote from Wendell Berry, who is a food activist that people are fed by the food industry which pays no attention to health and treated by the health industry which pays no attention to food. This, my friends, is what you can change. This is your leverage point and this is why you're here today. So it excites me that you are all here today. Planetary health. Just to say this is a whole lecture in itself but what we do, if we change our lifestyles for the better, for us, for our children, for our families, for our patients, we are also helping this earth. That planetary health um, is the concept really that health of the planet and health of us as humans is inextricably linked. And that a diet that is high in plant-based food is the only sustainable solution for our planet as well as ourselves. This is the, from the United States, um, Nations Committee on Nutrition, and it really says also that greenhouse gas production is very high, and the most important thing is our diet. National Academy of Science, now this is US-based, but it's also beginning to realize that 70% of the greenhouse gases can be reduced simply by adopting 
adopting a plant-based diet. This is the global impact of our diet. That one, what we call a surf and turf dinner, so both steak and seafood, is equivalent to over 800 kilograms of carbon dioxide emission. 800 kilograms. Unbelievable. So that's about the same as a small to medium car driving from one side of the United States to the other, which is 4,500 kilometers. Also, I measured it, and it's about the same of, as Lahore to Karachi and back. So that's 2,400 kilometers each way. So each time that you have steak, that is the footprint of that animal husbandry. So why lifestyle medicine? Really because we talk about diet, and physicians know to talk about diet. They say, okay, take these pills, come back and see me in three months, and I also want you to eat well and to exercise regularly. But lifestyle medicine must become the first treatment option. And I want to thank you and thank so many of the physicians in the room really for beginning to challenge us that there are, there is a need for, for pharmacology, there is a need for drugs, there is a need for bypass surgery. But that need can be substantially reduced if we actually look at the root causes of disease. What is lifestyle medicine? And I quote from Wayne Geisinger, who is, who is one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine in the United States, and um, really says it's an evolving approach to patient care that fo focuses on comprehensive, evidence-based health assessment and natural treatment. The pillars of lifestyle medicine we'll talk about in just a moment. However, even though Dr. Deal has been working in this area for such a long time and there are so many other people who are really we are standing on their shoulders, we can go back to 2,000 years, I'm sorry, 2,400 years ago um, with Hippocrates. The simple statement of let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. If we remember nothing else from today, if you can remember that, you're going to have a great life. So these are the pillars of lifestyle medicine, and I actually am really happy because this slide is almost redundant. All of your speakers, and thank you again, Dr. Feroz, we're talking about the same things. Six pillars. Nutrition, exercise, tobacco and alcohol control, stress management, and healthy relationships. Happiness. The evidence overwhelmingly supports the efficacy of lifestyle medicine, and Dr. Deal really went over this well, that there's general lifestyle medicine, the evidence of heart disease with Dr. Esselstyn and people who've come after him, then also the telomere impact. Now that is mainly from the work of Dr. Dean Ornish, who was also highlighted earlier. Um, the telomere impact is called the epigenetic effect. So what you eat, what you eat is going to affect your children, it's going to affect your children's children to the third generation. So no pressure, sorry. <laughs> um, and in that way it can also affect cancer. Then erectile dysfunction, cognitive function. There is more and more evidence that dementia can be delayed or prevented through lifestyle medicine. Stroke, heart disease, diabetes. The story and the evidence. Now again, I'm really just briefly touching on this, but as you get more and more interested, remember these names. Some of these people, and I, I wish that I had more room for more because there are so many people in the space who are, as you, really discovering this and being able to put the numbers together and show how evidence-based our medicine is. Um, T. Colin Campbell was the author of the China study, the first epidemiological study to really show diet and heart disease are irreversibly linked in populations. Um, Caldwell Esselstyn, who was spoken about earlier at the, at the Cleveland Clinic to reverse heart disease, reverse some of the worst cases of heart disease through diet alone. Nathan Pritikin also Thank you. We spoke about and his, um, his work specifically within cancer, but also in several other areas. Dr. Hans Deal, who you and I have the pleasure of really being able to listen to and sit at the feet and learn from, um, from all of his expertise and wisdom. And Dr. 
Michael Greger. Now, there's a great website that I encourage you to have a look at. It's nutritionfacts.org, and Michael Greger has put together 30 years. He's a Harvard-trained professor who's put together 30 years of evidence on lifestyle medicine. Nutritionfacts.org, if you want to learn more. Now, bringing it to the people like you who are creating a difference, the people like Dr. Feroz, who simply heard about lifestyle medicine, came to a little bit of a session like this, <laughs> started reading about things, started looking on the internet, and now, now look at this. It is completely possible. And for this change to affect other people, if each one of you talks to five other people, places where you live, where you work, where you worship, then you are all multipliers. You are multipliers, and this movement is about multipliers. It is not a high profit movement. It is not something which is going to make millions of dollars, and that is why, just as Dr. Deal said, you know, it's broccoli is not advertised on all the billboards that are all over town. And that is why it's up to us, it's up to us as regular people to be able to make this change. This is the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance. This is made up of regular people, physicians in different countries, and other interested people, specifically clinicians, who are passionate about lifestyle medicine, create a group in their country, come together, and this is some of the things that they have done. This is a little bit about what we do. You can look at our website. It's lifestylemedicineglobal.org. Started with just four countries who um, came to us in the United States and said, we want to be able to make our people better. How can we do this? Drugs are not working. Chronic disease is incurable. How can we do this? Coming to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, out of that the Global Alliance was formed, and the rest is history. Now we have over 42 countries. 42 countries. And this, the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance, was formed less than three years ago. So this is really the way of the future. This is exploding in so many ways. And you are at the cusp. Now I'm just going to give you a little bit of an idea about what's happening in the different regions. And feel free to stop me or ask any questions, because it's a bit of, I'm going to need to go fast, <laughs> just to give you a little bit of a smattering about what's going on. In Canada, the first ever dietary guidelines recommending a whole food plant-based diet. Now we talk about this plant-based all the time. What does whole food plant-based really mean? As Dr. Dio highlighted, it really means that you are eating foods as they come out of the ground or off the trees and off the plants, not out of packages. Plant-based really means that it's plants, that it's the original food. You're not eating second-hand food. You're not eating food that was initially eaten by a cow and you're now you're eating the cow. However, whole food plant-based is not purely vegetarian. It's not purely vegan. It's not paleo. It's not the Mediterranean diet. Is, is that most of your nutrients, most of your calories, 90% is coming from those whole foods. So we need to unite. We need to not really worry about, well, I really don't think that I can not eat any meat for the rest of my life. Well, oh, I actually like eating carbohydrate, and I like eating a little bit of fat. Carbohydrate is incredibly important, and fat is in a lot of things that we eat in whole food, plant-based diets. So that's really the definition. So the Canadian Association now have as a national guideline, whole food, plant-based. Then we also have a think tank, the Centre for a Livable Future at Johns Hopkins, looking at leverage points for health in the food industry. And we have the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, who are really leaders in this area. If we go to South America, now there's LALAMA, the Latin American Lifestyle Medicine Association, in Peru, in Chile, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Costa Rica, in Ecuador, in Mexico. So many physicians, so many people are passionate about this. And just a medical student who started in Brazil, organizing other people in their medical school, and now has started this whole huge movement of medical students. In Africa, it's just beginning. Now, Africa is such a huge subcontinent. And just like in Pakistan, we have the opportunity to stop before the SAD diet, which we call the standard American diet. So the SAD diet is completely adopted. 
this is the time we can intervene. And the same here in Pakistan. You're heading a little more towards the sad diet, and, but now is the time where you can intervene. You can see where this could lead, and you can stop it. You can stop it right now by what you eat when you walk out of this room. In Australasia, so in Australia, New Zealand, now also in the South Pacific, in Fiji, the Solomon Islands, the Cook Islands, um, let me see, Kiribati and Nuuva, those, all of those people at places, there are now lifestyle medicine interested physicians. And in Asia. So we have you right at the center here. But we also have the Philippine Association, we have um, movements in Korea, in Taiwan, in China. The next uh, conference will be, actually, we have a conference in India, uh, which is going on in a few days. And then in Korea, next year will be the All Asian um, Society of Lifestyle Medicine conference as well. So we go on. In Europe, we have many, many lifestyle medicine organizations, too many really to talk about. Suffice to say, you are not alone. You are not alone. When you embark on this journey, you have colleagues, you have your family. You might feel like you're going again to trend, against the trend, trend of just eating what The trend of not exercising because we have too much time and we feel we need to spend all of our time on our phones and our tablets. But you have friends, you have colleagues in all of these places. Israel and the Middle East, um, Qatar, and in Dubai, and in Saudi Arabia, and in other areas, uh, let me see, Abu Dhabi also in the UAE. So all of these places, lifestyle medicine is taking off. Now, how do we know that people who say they do lifestyle medicine really do lifestyle medicine? Dr. Feroz is amazing, because she has trained, she is Harvard trained in lifestyle medicine. And now we have certifications, the same examination that people sit in Berlin, in Dublin, in Seoul, in the United States, all over the world. You can become certified in lifestyle medicine. These are the upcoming examinations over the next year and a half. So if you can find yourself in any of these places, and you're welcome to talk about developing um, the curriculum. We have curriculums as well online, as well as case studies through your own patients. You can do this as an allied health professional or as a physician to really become competent in lifestyle medicine, more than what we can offer in just a few minutes. This is just to show that it is not just the health profession that is now interested in lifestyle medicine. Greenpeace approached us just a little while ago, and now that you think of them as an environmental agency, now they actually have a campaign, eat less meat, more plants. That's to save the planet. And finally, the World Health Organization. So this was three weeks ago. Um, I spoke at the World Health Organization in Geneva in Switzerland. They realize this is the only sustainable solution. So welcome to the party. Welcome to the movement. Welcome to a new life of happiness, of health, and of delicious nutrition.